I guess I'll have to do it. I guess I'll have to do it while I'm here. Father, but through all your testimony, there have been references to what went on in Chicago. And I think it's important that the panel knows just what did go on in Chicago at the time of the Democratic Convention, um, insofar as your part is concerned. Would you give us an account of your activities, who you went with, what happened? Uh, prior to the National Convention, there was a state convention, usual procedure. I ran for the position of delegate in the 19th Congressional District, and I came in fifth and there were only four slots available. So it was at this time that Aldo Bagnazzi, the congressional chairman, said, don't worry, Jim, we'll get you there. So when they were announcing the names of the delegates, he said, it is also by recommendation of the 19th caucus that Father James L. Meyer be, by acclamation of the convention, the official chaplain of the Michigan delegates. So that was all right. When I got to Chicago, I shared a room with a congressional candidate for my district in the Hollywood Hotel, the congressional candidate, Gary Frank who I worked for in promoting his candidacy. It was decided at the caucus that in lieu of vacancies in the 19th District Caucus, that I would serve in the capacity on the caucus. In other words, in other words, I would be what might be termed as a substitute for alternative delegate. It was in that capacity on Thursday And I invited these people back to my house for a birthday dinner party. Hungry crowd. You all could come too if you want. So you're a comedian, I see. Oh, you are correct. <laughs> so you can't see much further than that, can you? Look, man, ain't gonna be no gas. We're gonna walk right across that street legally. And if you arrest us illegally, that'll be false imprisonment and arrest. Officers, we're not going to the convention. We're just Taking an evening stroll. If you go anywhere else than West, you will all be arrested. On what grounds? Law and order. Law and order? <laughs> ain't no grounds for that. Look, man, we ain't on our way to some convention. We are on our way as private citizens to my house. Well, we've been instructed to arrest anyone who goes in any direction other than West. Would you allow us a few moments to talk this over among ourselves? Sure. But if you take one step off that sidewalk, you will be arrested. More harm is going to be caused by dispersing than by striving to continue. They'll just arrest us and beat the kids. It could get messy. Sure, they may bruise them a bit. If they arrest us, we'll have to arrest the kids, too. Man, they ain't going to have no mind about it. As soon as they arrest us, they're going to do whatever they want to to those kids. They won't have no mind about it. Reminds me of the time we were trying to integrate the schools down in Mississippi. 
there I was walking hand in hand with these five year olds right, right up to this clean white schoolhouse. Just like the US Supreme Court said we could. And there they were waiting on us. The sheriffs and, and all of them cracker KKKs. And they cut us down and they stomped on us. About 10 feet away, I see this, this five-year-old girl with her head busted wide open. You ain't seen nothing in your life till you see a five-year-old girl get hit in the head by a grown man with a brick. I've met some mean people in my day, and I ain't about to back down now out of no fear of being arrested for supporting the rights of these kids. Right. Let's go. done a great injustice to the black man in this country by having kidnapped our people and brought us here and down to the level that we're on today. And today, instead of approaching the factors that their original mistake has created, and instead of approaching these factors objectively and realistically, their greatest sin that they're doing now is trying to pretend that they never committed a crime, that they never did any wrong. And when we point out the injustices that our people are facing, they make that seem worse by accusing us of teaching hate or advocating violence simply because we are pointing out the real factors in the problem. You were born in Omaha, is that right? Yes, sir. And your family left Omaha when you were about what, one year old? I imagine, about a year old. And why did your family leave Omaha? Well, uh, to my understanding, the Ku Klux Klan burned down one of their homes in Omaha. So that must have made your family feel very unhappy, I'm sure. Well, insecure, if not unhappy. So. You must have a prejudiced point of view, a personally prejudiced point of view. And in other terms, you cannot look at this in a broad or academic sort of way, really. I think that's incorrect, because despite the fact that that happened in Omaha, and then when we moved to Lansing, Michigan, our home was burned down again. In fact, my father was killed by the Ku Klux Klan. And despite all of that, no one was more thoroughly integrated with whites than I. No one has lived more so in the society of whites than I. You have been on record saying, and I quote, there is no justice here for us black people, there is no future here for us nor our children in civilized society. That's correct. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you're gonna get out or what? Well, it means the same thing that Attorney Robert, General 
Attorney General Robert Kennedy means when he says that the number one domestic problem in America is the race problem, that it is almost impossible to solve it, that it is almost impossible to give justice to Negroes. Brothers and sisters, oh, Father Meyer here has been working with our youth to put the 